Hello, everyone. My, uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, going to be about uh, innate immunity and more specifically about the contribution of innate immunity to uh, herd immunity. Herd immunity primarily against uh, acute viral infections. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an acute viral infection. And uh, so what I am going to talk today, to tell today, is not going to be just specific for SARS-CoV-2, but in principle applies to uh, all acute viral infections. And uh, the reason we are interested, of course, in herd immunity with regard to the current pandemic is that we think uh, that by generating sufficient herd immunity, we are going to get rid of this pandemic. And I think this is the end goal of uh, the uh, vaccinations that uh, have been initiated, that have been uh, rolled out and uh, have been brought up to speed in, uh, in, in many, many countries by, uh, by now. So uh, it is, I would say, critical to very well understand the contribution, uh, the importance of innate immunity as a contributor to herd immunity, as without that understanding, I think is simply impossible, impossible to understand what is going on right now uh, in this pandemic. And uh, it's also impossible to understand how to handle this pandemic best. So as you all know, I think the way it's handled right now is, uh, is scientifically not uh, adequate. And uh, I think part of this comes from the fact that uh, people do not realize the critical importance of uh, innate immunity to uh, herd immunity in this pandemic. So I've uh, made a couple of slides uh, to vis visualize my thoughts and my insights on this. And uh, I would like uh, to share them uh, with you and I will give uh, some um, explanations along uh, when we, as we move forward with the slides. So I'm going to try to uh, share my screen with you. Um, there we go. Um, and then, okay. Okay, so the, the, the title of my talk is Innate Immunity is the Cornerstone of Herd Immunity Against uh, Acute Viral Infections. So first of all, to talk about, um, to explain a little bit what I mean by innate immunity, I, I really mean the effectors of innate immunity as uh, opposed or uh, in contrast to the uh, effectors of uh, adaptive immunity. So innate immunity, the effectors of innate immunity are uh, uh, B cells and uh, those uh, B cells are uh, B1 cells. I'm not going to go into uh, much detail, but uh, B1 cells, uh, they uh, secrete natural antibodies. And we are uh, going to see immediately what are the specifics of those natural antibodies. Uh, so there is the humoral component of uh, the innate effector um, part of the immune system, which are the natural antibodies. And there is also the uh, cellular component and uh, the cellular component uh, consists of uh, NK cells. So these are uh, natural killer cells. So natural antibodies, natural killer cells. Those really constitute the uh, first line of uh, immune defense. And natural antibodies are in fact pre-programmed. They, um, they are fast, they can immediately uh, react, they can immediately come into the play and uh, for example, neutralize uh, viruses. They um, have a very interesting feature uh, in the sense that they are uh, non-specific, so they are characterized by low affinity for uh, antigens, and uh, therefore they can interact in a non-specific way with uh, multiple, multiple uh, pathogens, multiple antigens. So, for example, as it comes to COVID-19, uh, uh, COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2, these uh, natural antibodies are capable of neutralizing a large spectrum of uh, variants, of, of, of COVID variants, and, and even a broad array of uh, coronaviruses. Natural immunity typically has uh, no memory, so uh, that means that uh, you cannot recall these antibodies uh, by bringing in contact with an antigen that the immune system has previously seen. 
And uh, there is uh, that this has a, or these characteristics do have a few consequences. First of all, because the natural antibodies have to deal, have to be able to deal with several different pathogens, they uh, can only deal with a relatively low uh, load. For example, in terms of viruses, a relatively low viral load. So you can imagine if you have to deal with several different enemies at the same time, there is only so much energy you can spend on one single uh, enemy. So um, they cannot deal very efficiently with uh, high loads of, uh, of uh, viral uh, particles, uh, and the same applies to bacteria, for example. The uh, other disadvantage, so to, so to say, is that this immunity is not permanent. So as we uh, uh, grow older for older, for example, we will have less and less uh, innate um, antibodies, natural antibodies. And uh, also people who, uh, for example, have weakened immunity or gets immune suppressed, their uh, level of antibodies, natural antibodies will also drop. So it's not an immunity that, so to say, is 100% uh, reliable, as there is a number of factors that can diminish the concentration of these uh, natural antibodies. On the other hand, uh, so I'm not going into uh, the detail of what natural antibodies can really do, but as far as SARS-CoV-2 is concerned, um, there is evidence indeed that this type of antibodies can perfectly uh, prevent uh, SARS-CoV-2 particles, viral particles, from interacting with AC2, uh, with the AC2 receptor on uh, susceptible cells, uh, respiratory epithelial cells. And uh, I put on my website uh, a lot of, uh, frankly speaking, I think very, very interesting uh, publications about uh, innate uh, antibodies, natural antibodies, and what they can do. And uh, it's also very clear uh, from uh, the, the content of these publications and other references that the way these antibodies bind to uh, viral particles, for example, is uh, very, very different from the way antigen-specific antibodies bind to viral particles. So they bind with much less uh, affinity. Uh, the, this binding is based on multivalent interaction. So it's a very, very different from an antigen-specific interaction. And uh, on the other hand, there is also a lot of uh, evidence, I would say, that um, these antibodies are indeed capable of neutralizing a vast array of, uh, of different variants within one and the same viral species. So this has uh, particularly been uh, shown, for example, for, uh, for influenza virus, where uh, uh, several different um, scientists have shown that natural antibodies are capable of um, neutralizing and dealing and protecting against uh, a number of uh, several different uh, influenza strains even. So in contrast to this innate part of the immune system, and I'm talking really about effectors, these are effector cells like B cells, like uh, uh, cytotoxic uh, effector cells, we have something similar on the adaptive side. Uh, the, we, we call this the acquired or the adaptive uh, immune effector cells. They consist of B cells as well and T cells. So uh, now the... Um, uh, the, the B cells that secrete, so to say, the antigen-specific uh, antibodies are uh, B2 cells, and but it's a little bit more complicated than this, but I'm trying to simplify. So it's a different part, if you, if you, you like, a different type of uh, B cells. And, uh, and then, of course, also we have uh, the T cells. So uh, it's also important to say that uh, B and T cells, uh, just like uh, the B1 cells and the NK cells, they can also synergize by synergizing. So for example, antibodies are capturing uh, antigens or particles and are um, then introducing them into antigen presenting cells. And uh, these antigen presenting cells patterns that are presented on these antigen presenting cells can then be recognized, for example, in the case of innate immunity by NK cells. In case of adaptive immunity, uh, specific antigens after antigen uptake, processing, and presentation 
or then presented to, uh, for example, T cells, uh, uh, could also be cytolytic T cells that can then kill also the infected uh, cells. So there is this kind of synergy is a little bit uh, similar between uh, antibodies and uh, the effector killer cells, be it uh, cytolytic T cells for the adaptive immunity or NK cells for the uh, innate immunity. And uh, so the difference, of course, is that uh, all these things, whether it's neutralizing by the natural antibodies or killing by the NK cells, this, this goes very, very fast and be done at a very, very early stage of infection. Whereas with regard to the adaptive immunity, it all takes time because the, the antibodies need to, 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 uh, you know, to be generated, uh, to mature, uh, affinity maturation, et cetera. So this is a slower process. And with regard, for example, to cytolytic T cells that can really kill virus infected cells, uh, well, this is uh, more often the mechanism that comes to play when people got already infected, got the disease, and then can cure out uh, the disease thanks to these uh, cytolytic T cells. So um, the combination of the, uh, the B cells secreting antigen specific antibodies, uh, those are uh, antigen induced, so this is uh, very, very specific. It's, it's not like uh, all kinds of, uh, well, all kinds, also the natural antibodies do not recognize all kinds, but they recognize patterns that are shared amongst a number of different pathogens, whereas the um, acquired antibodies, so to say, they do this in a very specific uh, way, in an antigen specific way. So they have a high level of uh, specific, uh, specificity. This is due to their uh, high affinity. And uh, this system, the adaptive immune system does have memory, which is of course very, very interesting because thanks to the, uh, to the memory, the uh, response, the specific response can be recalled very, very fast and uh, is very, very reliable because the memory is there. And if the um, organism or the host gets in contact again with the antigen, it can immediately target that antigen. It can immediately, the immune system can immediately concentrate its full energy on that specific antigen. And that is also the reason why the adaptive immune system can cope with a high viral load. It, it does not need to tackle the different enemies at the same time. When it gets recalled, it's immediately there. It's immediately focused on the invading uh, antigen. And uh, that is, of course, uh, that has, of course, uh, a high advantage. So uh, that is also the reason, I would say, why we vaccinologists are, uh, yeah, are, are, are excited about vaccines. If you can uh, prime somebody, and um, this person now has uh, an immunological memory, when he or she gets again in contact with the antigen or with the pathogen, the, the immune system can be immediately reactivated in the right way, specifically directed at that uh, specific antigen or uh, pathogen. And uh, this is very reliable, even um, elderly people uh, in the older ages, uh, this mechanism, this memory is still there and can with almost like the same efficiency uh, be recalled to tackle the invading pathogens. So as we grow up and as we age, we come in contact with more and more and more pathogens and therefore um, Progressively, the adaptive immune system is like dominating the innate immune system because it comes, of course, then more and more important to deal with several different pathogens in a very efficient way. And uh, there, there are some limitations for the innate immune system. In fact, for the adaptive, uh, there is only very, very few limitations, but there is one important limitation also for the adaptive immunity. And that is that um, adaptive immunity, as um, uh, you can read here, is very, very specific. So uh, it's not going to be possible to recall your adaptive immune response with exactly the same efficiency against another pathogen or an antigen that is not uh, the same or very similar to the one that has originally induced uh, the uh, memory. So uh, I think it's important to, 
and, and this is one of the slides that I uh, showed um, in my presentation in uh, Ohio in, in March of this year, uh, just to illustrate how antigen-specific antibodies are interacting with natural antibodies. And I'm giving here the example of the most prevalent um, natural antibodies, the IgMs, that are multi-antigen specific, as I, as I said, whereas the um, IgG, the uh, acquired uh, antibodies are antigen specific. So these are two uh, uh, viruses. The one is the original uh, SARS-CoV-2, and this is an infectious, uh, highly infectious variant. So th those are not, have not exactly the same antigenic features. So I guess what I'm trying to illustrate here is that specific antibodies, antigen-specific antibodies, can bind with a high affinity to the antigen that uh, they that the, the, the antigen that has originally induced these antibodies. So, for example, if you uh, make a vaccine and uh, you use, in this case, uh, spike protein or parts of the spike protein that are the same as those of the original uh, circulating SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, strain, and you immunize with those vaccines, then you, you, can, you can achieve a very, very strong immune response against this uh, original uh, SARS-CoV-2 strains. And uh, this is a binding with very, very high affinity. Affinity is going to be less good if, the, if you have a variant, if you have a viral particle, which is still pretty similar, but not exactly the same, certainly not with regard to the antigenic constellation of the uh, S protein, which was the protein, uh, remember, that we are using uh, in the vaccines. But so it may well be that, for example, this binding with high affinity is still completely, is, uh, well, more than sufficient, of course, uh, to not only bind to the spike protein, but to really neutralize it in a sense that uh, the strong binding will prevent this viral particle from interacting with the uh, AC2 receptor on the uh, respiratory or epithelial cell. Whereas uh, if uh, the antibody has lower affinity, it may still bind, but not necessarily still be able to neutralize uh, the virus. But in any case, regardless of the strength of binding to these um, SARS-CoV-2 particles, original or uh, variants, the binding of this antigen-specific IgG, because it is specific and therefore has high affinity, will always be stronger than the binding of a multimeric natural antibody to these particles. This multimeric anti antibody binds with the same strength to these variants because it's a completely different principle of binding. Uh, it recognizes patterns on, on these uh, viral surfaces, not uh, specific antigens. And so it's important to realize that if you induce antigen-specific antibodies, which is, as I was saying, fantastic because you can target your pathogen in a much more specific way, well, then it is, it is important, it's very, very important that the specificity targets really the, the, the pathogen that you want to eliminate or that, that you want to neutralize. Because if it does not, let's say you have a variant that is pretty different with regard to its antigenic constellation, it will still bind, but no longer neutralize. And then you cannot say, yeah, yeah, but I'm still having my uh, natural antibodies there that can help to do the job that this low affinity antibody cannot do. No, this is finished because these guys, the antigen specific antibodies will bind still to the variant, to the spike protein. And by doing so, these antibodies will outcompete the natural antibodies for binding to the pathogen. So once you have induced those, you can no longer rely on your natural antibodies. Well, this is of course an extreme case. The, they outcompete, but this outcompetition, this outcompeting activity is in many cases, of course, not 100%, but there is a strong advantage uh, for these uh, specific antigens to interact with the particle compared to um, the uh, natural antibodies. So in, in other words, if you, you it, well, in other words, it is key, it is key when you induce antibodies against your pathogen that you do it in a way that is very, very specific. 
because if it is not, if the specific the specificity is not optimal, if it is suboptimal, then you may have a problem in the sense that the antigen specific uh, antibody is no longer uh, capable to completely neutralize the viral particles and those particles that are no longer completely neutralized can no longer be fully recognized by the uh, IgM natural antibodies because the antigen specific or at least to some extent or to an important uh, extent outcompeting them. So I guess what I want to say is that um, there are a number of conditions under which one generates suboptimal is specific antibodies, and now I'm talking about SARS-CoV-2 uh, more specifically, but in the meantime, blocks natural antibodies. So if you generate a specific antibodies in a way that is suboptimal, that's not gonna be very profitable in the sense that uh, you may not neutralize or completely neutralize uh, your virus, but you do block your antibodies, your natural antibodies, sorry, to some extent. So when does that happen? Well, for example, let's look at natural symptomatic infection. Uh, you, you can have an infection and then uh, afterwards, for example, your uh, specific antibodies will decline. Uh, if you have a high infectious pressure, it can well be that during this decline, you get reinfected with the, the virus. And when antibodies are declining, they, uh, their titers may no longer be sufficient to neutralize the virus, but they may still be sufficient to outcompete your natural antibodies. So you're ending up in a situation where your body, your immune system can no longer really deal very well with the pathogen. And at the same time, your natural immunity is suppressed. So that is a case where you could even end up upon the reinfection after the first natural infection with a more severe disease because of your, the suppression of your innate immune system. And, and these things happen. We know that these things happen with, um, with SARS-CoV-2, for example, where people get reinfected after a number of weeks or months and uh, do more severe disease than uh, upon the previous uh, exposure. It can also happen during asymptomatic infection. Remember, I've said this a number of times in my uh, talks and um, in, in, in the literature, that when you get infected uh, in an asymptomatic way with uh, SARS-CoV-2, so you, you don't have uh, any symptoms, for example, a number, uh, a fair amount of those people, they will end up with suboptimal antibodies. They eliminate a virus very, very fast. Most likely, I would say this is in fact, for me, it's proven that it's due to NK cells, so not due to uh, antibodies that appear later in the process. So, but there is some kind of recognition. The stimulus didn't last very long because the virus was eliminated within just uh, a few days. And uh, you have some suboptimal antibodies that are really not very mature. If during this stage, these people who got asymptomatically infected or sitting on the suboptimal antibodies get reinfected with a virus, this is a kind of similar situation as the one that I described before. The, these antibodies, as we were saying, are suboptimal, will not do a good, a good job in neutralizing the virus, but they will suppress and to some extent outcompete the natural antibodies. So that is, these are uh, cases, for example, where uh, people who got asymptomatically infected upon reinfection get, for example, severe COVID disease. A third situation is a, a situation where uh, somebody is seronegative, has no antibodies, no specific, no specific antibodies. So I mean seronegative for a specific antibodies. And th these are people, for example, that we are um, vaccinating. Uh, so they get their first shot. What happens after the first shot, especially in the first days after the first shot, they start mounting antibodies. These antibodies can, of course, at that early stage, not be uh, fully mature and not reach very high titers. But if the infectious pressure is, is high, for example, during a pandemic, they can be reinfected just a few days after they got the first shot. And these are typically the cases where people do severe disease, COVID disease, after the first shot. Why is this? Well, again, the same story, suboptimal antibodies, but 
affinity is high enough to bind to the S protein and hence outcompete the natural antibodies. So their natural uh, immune uh, response is completely uh, or to a large extent, uh, sorry, suppressed. So all these conditions of suboptimal immunity, they can predispose to immune escape. I'm not going to explain again what immune escape uh, means, but um, it's clear that if you have suboptimal immune responses in a large part of the population, why in a large part of the population? Well, because you're vaccinating a lot of people eh, who are seroconvert, you know, have to wait for their second dose, uh, for example, and um, at the same time, you have a lot of virus around. Well, then uh, some variants that appear sp spontaneously can get trained because they encounter this unfavorable suboptimal situation very frequently. They can be trained uh, to, to replicate and to propagate in the presence of this uh, immune pressure. And hence, uh, this is what uh, ultimately will uh, make um, viral va variants uh, very, very fit and uh, will enable them to, to propagate at uh, high levels in, uh, in the population. But uh, it's not only predisposing to immune escape, uh, the suboptimal conditions will also uh, occasionally lead to, to, to severe disease, as I just, uh, as I just uh, explained. So, uh, Mass vaccination in the midst of a pandemic leads to selection and adaptation of more infectious variants, as what I just said, and ultimately resistance to vaccinal antibodies. So I've forgotten vaccinal there. So it needs to be resistant to vaccinal antibodies, but while uh, whilst blocking natural antibodies. So how does this work again? And I think this mechanism is, is very, very important to uh, basically understand. Um, how how the curves of infectivity of disease etc evolve in in several different countries so when you have mass vaccination first of all you increase the circulation of more infectious variants so what i'm saying is that first of all um, well we have already we, we were already seeing a number of uh, infectious strains that were circulating before really we we, we started the mass vaccination so these uh, infectious variants, they got a competitive advantage when we started mass vaccination because mass vaccination is inducing immune responses, of course, against the S protein of the original virus, which, which is not the same of the, of the variants. And uh, so you give these already present uh, variants a competitive advantage. But even if you don't do so, uh, the fact that for example, you have people when you start mass vaccination who start seroconverting, uh, who are uh, waiting for a second dose, uh, for example. And because these vaccines do not completely protect against uh, transmission, you will always have some leakage. And, uh, and because the suboptimal conditions are uh, present in a large number of vaccinees, you may start to see the occurrence of infectious variants. And because more infectious variants are going to start to circulate or are already circulating, but now due to this uh, competitive advantage, uh, due to the immune pressure by the vaccination, they will all of a sudden take over all other strains and become completely dominant. So, Anyway, the result of that is that you increase the infection rate in the population. So the virus, would say, becomes more infectious because there is more uh, infectious variants that are predominantly circulating. So what does that mean? Well, if the infectivity rate uh, increases, then, of course, uh, the likelihood that somebody who got previously asymptomatically infected and is sitting on suboptimal antibodies gets now in contact again, so re-exposed to the virus, becomes higher and higher. So there is a higher uh, likelihood for re-exposure of pre uh, previously asymptomatically infected carriers. So that will explain already, while now in a number of these uh, asymptomatically infected carriers, you will have a wave of disease. So all of a sudden, in uh, a fairly substantial amount, 
of these carrier of these carriers, the uh, natural antibodies will be suppressed, will be outcompeted to an extent that it, that makes them susceptible enough to get a disease. So that is where all of a sudden you will see uh, a wave of disease in these asymptomatically infected carriers. What you see after this wave is an immediately a, a, a quite steep decline in the uh, infection rate in the population. So why is this? Well, the remainder of the uh, asymptomatically infected uh, carriers, they still have sufficient antibodies, sufficient natural antibodies to withstand, to resist the, uh, the, the infectious pressure. And uh, so they will still be able to resist the infection. And because they are asymptomatic carriers, so the infection rate will, uh, dramatically, uh, will dramatically drop. So they will still, based on their natural antibodies, they are still sufficient to resist the infection. So the infection rate will dramatically drop. But when this, uh, that the infection is still now um, being transmitted within this population of the asymptomatic carriers. But as I was saying, the infection rate dropped dramatically. So this is the time where the virus is going to select more infectious variants. Why is this? Well, I was saying this asymptomatically infected people, they uh, are after, after asymptomatic infection, they are raising antibodies that are suboptimal. So the virus uh, can still replicate in those people, but their natural antibodies are still sufficient to prevent disease, no problem. But there is some immune pressure that is put by those asymptomatic carriers. Uh, on the S protein of the of the virus. So why S protein? Because the antibodies they mount, suboptimal antibodies, are directed against the uh, S protein. And so uh, variants that arise, but that will be able to overcome this pressure, will have an advantage. And we know that these type of infectious variants are uh, variants that select mutations especially within several different domains of S protein that increase the effectivity of the virus. And uh, so um, that is primarily due, due to the fact that the anti-S antibodies, the super optimal anti-S antibodies generated by these asymptomatic carriers have pretty low affinity. They are not fully mature, as I said, and uh, they are directed against several different domains of the uh, S protein. So, while the infectivity rate is relatively low, the virus is encountering suboptimal conditions in a reservoir of people that are now sustaining the replication of this virus, namely the asymptomatic carriers. And um, you will see that uh, after a while, you have more and more of these variants circulating. And frankly speaking, that is what we have seen uh, since the mass vaccination got implemented. Since we implemented mass vaccination, all of a sudden we have seen more, many more infectious variants uh, arising. And, and this is pretty interesting or strange because, for example, during a natural pandemic, uh, for example, the flu pandemic of 1918, you didn't see such a thing at all. So the pandemic went through with, 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 with three waves spread all over the world, and, uh, and still there were no uh, variants with higher infectiousness arising. So here the situation is very, very different. So as uh, we have circulation of more infectious uh, variants in vaccinees, you will have selection and adaptation of resistant variants in the end. Why is this? Well, first of all, when you have more infectious variants circulating in the asymptomatic uh, infected people, then of course, because this um, becomes now a pretty limited reservoir of, of people. Why? Because more and more people get vaccinated. So, and, and we vaccinate people who have no symptoms. So more and more of these uh, asymptomatic uh, carriers become now uh, vaccinated. And uh, so if the virus wants to propagate and to persist, uh, in fact, the virus needs to adapt to 
the immune situation and the immune pressure put by uh, the, uh, the vaccinees. And in fact, the immune pressure put by the vaccinees is very, very similar to those put by the asymptomatic carriers that were non-vaccinated. Because remember, their immune response was directed against several di different domains in the S protein. Whereas in the vaccinees, the immune pressure that is put is essentially against the receptor binding domain because that is the domain that is targeted by the uh, antibodies, so by the vaccinal antibodies. But it is also still within the S protein. So in fact, because those antibodies have higher affinity than those of the non-vaccinated asymptomatic carriers, what the virus now simply needs to do is to overcome somewhat higher pressure because these antibodies now of the vaccinees have higher affinity uh, uh, to prevent uh, the, the infection. But as I was saying, the situation uh, in the vaccinees is oftentimes suboptimal uh, because first of all, there are more uh, infectious variants circulating. So the uh, recognition of the vaccinal antibodies that are directed against the original virus compared to uh, the S protein now of the variants is, 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 is pretty different. So you, you have a kind of heterogeneous situation where antibodies that uh, in fact do a fantastic job against the S protein of the original virus are now suboptimal because they do not fully recognize or not sufficient, uh, they do not sufficiently recognize the S protein of the variant. That is one thing. Second, plenty of people are vaccinated or uh, mounting antibodies, uh, seroconverting, others are waiting for the second dose, et cetera, et cetera. So you get now more and more um, selection, in fact, and adaptation, because many, many people are in this situation of variants that are going to overcome the um, binding affinity of the S, uh, anti -S uh, vaccinal antibodies to the uh, S protein. So what, what, what that, uh, when that happens, of course, you have an enormous, you will have an enormous backlash and you will have a wave of disease, no longer, of course, in the non-vaccinated uh, asymptomatic carriers because there, there, there are very few uh, of them left, but now more and more in vaccinated, uh, in, in vaccinated people, so in, in vaccinees. Uh, so uh, it is often said, well, mass vaccination prevents this. Uh, we had, and I will show you examples of mass vac vaccination, where mass vaccination uh, coincided, in fact, with um, the wave of disease, with the peak. Uh, so some countries like Israel, like uh, the UK, they have started their mass vaccination at a moment in time where uh, the peak was uh, at its summit, so to say. So. That, that was a kind of uh, coincidence. It's not like, and I will show you in, um, in, in, in some of the slides, that uh, this mass vaccination that occurred at that very point in time was the reason that the infection pressure uh, was decreased within the next uh, two weeks. Uh, if we look, for example, at the curves in um, countries that did not start their vaccination at the very height of the peak, uh, for example, India, Canada, Brazil, Uruguay, et cetera, Chile. What you see is that uh, a few weeks after mass vaccination started, one, you know, uh, not one week, several weeks, three, four, five, six weeks, depending on the speed also of vaccination, you got a steep increase in, uh, in infectivity. So, um, in some countries, there were already highly infectious variants circulating, like in Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, it was the Brazil variant. So there, the, the basic infectivity rate was already pretty high. When you then come with your vaccination, you give this variant a tremendous advantage and it really explodes. Whereas in other, other countries, this was much less the case and they had a much lower basic level of infectivity. But still there, at the same time, approximately several weeks after mass vaccination, you saw these infectivity rates uh, uh, going up. So here, it took very, very little time because the infectious variant, the Brazil variant, was already well prepared to go off. Eh? Uh, whereas here, because of the low infectivity rates uh, in, in India, for example, and in Canada, it took much longer before, uh, and, and the curves they increased up to a level that was uh, lower, like, for example, in comparison to Chile of, or, for example, Uruguay. 
So uh, if we, um, uh, next slide, uh, look for example here, that's what I meant. These three countries, Israel, the United States and the United Kingdom, they started vaccinating really at the very peak, at the very summit of the infectious wave. And uh, within a few, day, a few weeks, in fact, yeah, within two weeks, they got a very steep decline. For example, in the UK, they got a decline. I'm looking here at the figures. Over three weeks in, in the UK, here is the UK, three weeks, there was a decline of uh, 50%, 50%. Whereas I had only, at that point in time, that was in January, they had only vaccinated between 3.5 and 10% of the population. So over that whole month. And so very, very few people had and only one dose. And you got almost immediately a very, very steep decline. Whereas remember in Chile, after the same time, they had been vaccinating 40%, for example, of the people. And even then, they still didn't see any, any decrease uh, in, the, in the effectivity curves. On the contrary, the curves went up quite uh, dramatically. And you see the same in Israel, because in Israel, they also were vaccinating at the very height of the peak. And when they, did, when they vaccinated, um, I'm just looking here, they got also a steep, within the next uh, weeks, uh, a pretty steep decline. And uh, was also in, in, in January. And at that time, they had vaccinated 25% of the population. So the difference was seen very, very fast, much faster than any difference that was seen in the um, countries that were not doing mass vaccination at the very height of the peak. And again, even then, Chile, 40% is even much higher than the uh, vaccine coverage rate that was um, that was noted in Israel by that time, it was only 25%. So 25% was sufficient, so to say, to see a very steep decline also in Israel within a few weeks, whereas 40% after several weeks in Chile uh, just resulted in a steep uh, increase in the, um, in, in the effectivity rate. So let's for, uh, for a, uh, a moment look at what is the difference between a natural pandemic and uh, the current pandemic. The current pandemic, which is characterized by stringent uh, infection prevention measures and uh, mass vaccination. So in the natural pandemic, uh, the nicest example is uh, again, uh, influenza 1918. There were no, uh, this was war time, no infection prevention measures or, or um, negligible, I would say, and certainly no uh, vaccination, uh, let alone uh, mass vaccination. So what you saw there, and, and in yellow, I put, in fact, the columns are represent more or less the herd immunity of the population. But the yellow part uh, is the part uh, represents the vulnerable people. So in um, the uh, flu pandemic, 1918, you had uh, a certain part of people who were vulnerable and were immediately affected when this new virus came in and uh, got the disease. So uh, there was no, uh, not a lot of hygiene measures, not a lot of um, any kind of infection prevention. Uh, and one has to imagine this was uh, during uh, World War I. Uh, so uh, it was not a situation where people uh, had a lot of luxury. And uh, obviously the virus uh, spread uh, pretty fast. It spread so fast that uh, a number of uh, younger people who had been asymptomatically infected during this first wave, uh, which uh, affected primarily vulnerable people, uh, lost uh, their, uh, their natural immunity. Or uh, in other words, the uh, infection or the infectivity rate was so high be because there was little control of the spread of the pandemic that a number of asymptomatically infected people sitting on suboptimal antibodies got reinfected before they got rid of the suboptimal antibodies. And that may have been responsible for severe suppression in a large number of these uh, younger people of their innate immunity so that uh, they, uh, they got the disease. And we saw uh, a severe wave of disease, especially in younger people that is indicated by, uh, by two. But then we even saw a third wave, and uh, it's, it's very interesting to note that, um, of course, uh, the international traffic was not like uh, today. So you first had this thing developing in Europe, and then later on, it came to the, uh, to the Americas. And there, uh, obviously, 
uh, again, you had a third wave, which may have been the result of some vulnerable people that were still living on the other continent that had not been touched by the pandemic so far and that were vulnerable. So it was in fact a repeat of what had happened before. And again, this uh, infectivity rate may have increased to an extent where again, in some of the asymptomatic carriers on that other part uh, continent, uh, was suppressed so that you saw a little bit of even a fourth uh, wave. And uh, let me look, yeah, let, let me have a look at the next slide. So this is the first and second wave, primarily in Europe. And then you see this third wave, which was, which was probably a repeat uh, of the pandemic in the Americas. Uh, so this kind of peak, and then a little bit of a fourth peak. Um, I'm not saying my interpretation is fully correct. But at least it would it could have been explained by this uh, phenomenon that when you're sitting on suboptimal antibodies, your innate immunity uh, can be suppressed and you become susceptible really for uh, for the disease. So, but then when the pandemic comes to an end, what happens? Well, you have a kind of uh, equilibrium where people who got the disease, of course have now their antigen specific antibodies. So they are good, they are safe. So the part in fact, that got here eroded of the innate immunity because all these people, that's what I'm saying, innate immunity is such an important component of herd immunity. When the virus comes in, 80% or 85% of the people, depending on the composition of the population, is naturally protected thanks to their natural immunity. So that is fantastic herd immunity. It gets eroded though, when the infectivity rate increases, I've explained this, but then, this part that got eroded gets now, in fact, uh, compensated by uh, antigen-specific antibodies because people get the disease, they mount a um, serious amount of uh, antigen-specific uh, antibodies that uh, will uh, protect them. So now you get uh, this kind of, uh, sorry, this kind of equilibrium between uh, people who still have sufficient natural antibodies to protect them against uh, the virus and then others who previously got the disease and are now also protected thanks to their antigen specific antibodies. So the uh, herd immunity has now a little bit of different composition, antigen specific antibodies on one hand and natural antibodies on the other. But of course things evolve and as the population will age and as things, several things will happen, some people will start to lose their natural immunity. Uh, remember, as I said at the very beginning, natural antibodies are very interesting, they're multi-specific, but they are not 100% reliable because if you get, for example, immune suppressed, you age, uh, you get uh, underlying uh, diseases, for example, you, your innate immunity will diminish. And that will be, um, these people, when they lose their antibodies or when they have not, they don't lose them, but they don't have sufficient antibodies anymore, then they become again uh, vulnerable and uh, again, this part um, of the population that you can see here that has uh, no longer sufficient antibodies turns in fact to this zone. Uh, this should now be yellow because they become again uh, vulnerable. And that is how you can get an outbreak on the background of a very good herd immunity. So with the pandemic, this is completely different with the current pandemic. So as I was saying, we have the vulnerable people. That's where the virus came, came, came in. Uh, these people uh, started, of course, uh, spreading the infection. To some extent, we had already highly infectious strains circulating before the mass vaccination uh, got rolled out. So we had already a pretty high infectious uh, pressure. I think that due to the mass vaccination, the highly infectious strains that were already circulating or the more infectious strains, they got a boost because they got a competitive advantage uh, due to the uh, um, the immune response um, mounted in the vaccinees. And uh, hence what you saw is all of a sudden, I've shown it on the curves, uh, in, in countries that uh, vaccinated outside of the peak, you got a huge increase in uh, infectivity. And uh, there, of course, you had uh, a number of asymptomatic, previously asymptomatic, um, asymptomatically infected people who saw their innate immunity suppressed, a huge wave of disease, but then, the natural immunity in the other asymptomatically infected people is still sufficient and will block this infection. So infectivity rates will go down. But then as you further, of course, vaccinate and as 
the asymptomatic carriers that resisted or still or still uh, the carriers for the virus because that is where now when you vaccinate you have no longer uh, a lot of a lot of virus uh, spread in the uh, in the in the vaccinated population it is essentially now in the asymptomatic non vaccinated and they have now an opportunity by the phenomenon that i explained before because of the suboptimal antibodies with low affinity that are directed against several different regions of s of the spike protein if that evolves then you can again have more infectious variants that can possibly repeat this phenomenon. They are now uh, mounting the infectious pressure in the population and can now suppress the immune pressure, uh, the uh, immune, um, the natural immunity in the remainder, the remaining part of the asymptomatically infected. But that depends uh, on how fast the, max, the, the, the mass vaccination progresses. Because if the mass vaccination progresses very, very quickly, then the remainder of this asymptomatically infected carriers will be a very minor part of the population because these are the people who get vaccinated. So you will have more and more circulation of the virus and adaptation according to the, um, to the mechanism that I explained before in the vaccinated people. Now in these people, uh, the virus need to overcome the pressure of the antibodies. And I was saying the infectious variants were already doing very well because they were already overcoming pressure against the S protein. Uh, now the immune pressure by the vaccines is more specifically on the receptor binding domain. But as many of these vaccines are in suboptimal conditions, the virus can overcome this. And I'm sure the virus will overcome this. And that will lead to, to, to resistance. So now what has happened is that you have eroded your natural immunity in large parts of the population. And when resistance comes, then you will also destroy the adaptive immune response that has built in this population, no matter whether they uh, have been uh, vaccinated or naturally infected, they have this specific antibody. So when you get resistance, all these people now become susceptible. So here we have no equilibrium whatsoever between antigen specific and natural antibodies. We have erosion of natural immunity. That is because of the infectious variants that have all uh, continued to suppress and suppress and suppress the innate immunity in the previously asymptomatic carriers up to uh, a point in time where uh, mutations have been selected that were now um, able not just to overcome infectious pressure on S protein, but really to overcome the pressure on the receptor binding domain leading to resistance, which is of course a catastrophic, a catastrophic uh, situation. So um, just to summarize this, so when you have antigen specific antibodies, uh, they suppress innate antibodies. It's not a problem if the antigen specific antibodies are perfectly functional, that is, that it's, that, that's a great thing. But if they're not perfectly functional, you have a problem. So for example, if you have the original virus, this is perfect, high affinity of these antigen specific antibodies, uh, much lower affinity of the innate uh, antibodies. So you're better off with your antigen specific antibodies. If you now have, uh, for example, uh, a variant, and I'm now talking about antigenic drift because people very often uh, compare these uh, variants to it. They say, yeah, look at flu, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, flu, uh, could be a similar situation, but there we are talking about a phenomenon that is completely different. If you if you have a variant flu, as we have like um, almost every year, uh, this is what we call the antigenic drift. Well, what will happen is that uh, these variants are not have not been selected to be more infectious, and therefore, I mean, your innate antibodies will still work. They will not be suppressed in people but the antigen specific antibodies will work less well. So you may have a small wave, especially of course in vulnerable people. The, when we compare this to the uh, uh, immune escape variants that are more infectious, this is a completely different uh, situation. Although, and people may say, yeah, you know, the genetic differences are the same. You're still at uh, 98 or 90, 98.8% uh, uh, percentage of uh, similarity or 1.2% or, 1 .2 or 0.8% of difference. So in terms of genetic differences, yes, 
but uh, these variants have now been selected during mass vaccination campaigns to be more infectious. And because of the infectivity, they are capable of suppressing innate antibodies in asymptomatically infected. And that is what is a dramatic thing here. You see this minus, the, the antibodies are suppressed in a substantial amount uh, of people. That is also the reason why here, you will have a big wave. The antigen-specific antibodies can uh, recognize as well as they do this uh, viral uh, variant with less affinity. But here, this is the reason why you have now a big wave, and especially not in the vulnerable people, in the elderly, but in people that are much, much younger. These were the people who were best protected against uh, the um, uh, disease, sorry, in, um, uh, during the previous wave. So um, this is, um, according to my interpretation, the result really uh, this uh, in, in infectious variants of mass vaccination and mass prevention infection measures. So more infectious variants trained by is directed immune pressure cause dramatic disruption of herd immunity. So an, uh, an, a more extreme example is, um, so this is the previous example where I was talking about more infectious immune uh, escape variants. I just uh, put this on this slide again uh, the, for uh, the sake of comparison. But if now you have, for example, resistant immune escape variants, of course, they are even more infectious. They completely resist uh, the, uh, the antigen-specific antibodies. So you have here a complete uh, negative. But because of their very strong binding now to the uh, S protein, they can even much better overcome the uh, innate uh, antibody response of uh, the asymptomatically infected. So they are going to suppress to suppress much stronger the innate antibodies in uh, asymptomatically infected people. So here you will have a huge wave, and this huge wave, as I explained, because it is affecting now also uh, people who are, uh, have been immunized, uh, whether it is by natural infection or by uh, vaccination. So uh, this will cause a really big, big wave. And frankly speaking, and I'm, 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 I'm really, uh, I feel very, very sad about it. I feel completely devastated about this, but I'm pretty sure that is what we are gonna see uh, in countries where resistance will occur and um, I think resistance is going to be inevitable. Big, big waves in previously as asymptomatically infected uh, people as a result of mass vaccination and mass prevention infection uh, measures. So, um, yeah, okay. If we compare, if we compare this, because this is substantial change, so to say, a substantial uh, when uh, you have all the modifications, the mutations, when the virus becomes more infectious, then on top you may have these important mutations in the receptor binding domain. So here we are talking about much more important genetic um, variation, something in terms of uh, the degree or the level of genetic variation. You could maybe uh, compare this to an antigenic shift. For example, of influenza, not a drift, but a shift through recombination, etc., where uh, a completely different piece of say is inserted into uh, the genome. And uh, again, the antigen specific antibodies will not recognize. But here, because they are not selected to be more infectious, your innate antibodies will still work. And the wave may, we, may be bigger than in case of antigenic uh, drift but it will still be much less pronounced than the huge wave you will see as a result of um, resistance that occurred uh, during mass vaccination campaigns uh, in pandemic. So uh, to summarize this, innate immunity, adaptive immunity, mass vaccination with current vaccines in the midst of a pandemic lead to suppression of innate immunity. And that is primarily due to selection of uh, more infectious variants, to giving more infectious variants, even a higher competitive advantage. And uh, ultimately, of course, if you have uh, resistance, it has, uh, of course, uh, it abolishes your adaptive immunity. But, um, uh, no, uh, sorry, I, I must say in a first in a at in a first stage you have not of course uh, a resistance, but you have a higher infectious variants that are uh, recognized less well, of course, by your vaccinal antibodies. So you have a negative effect on the adaptive immunity. That was uh, what I uh, what I meant uh, what I meant here. So these uh, variants are less well recognized 
than uh, the original uh, virus. So, but then as things evolve, you have more infectious variants, you come to resistance ultimately. Well, then of course you have a dramatic negative effect. Your uh, antibodies don't work anymore. And you have even higher infectious, uh, uh, higher pressure on the, on the uh, innate immunity, higher um, uh, depression so that they are, they are uh, more uh, suppressed, higher, a higher level of suppression on your innate immunity. So uh, the consequences of the COVID-19 mass vaccination campaigns, well, uh, you can see that at the start of mass vaccination campaigns, um, they led within one or two months to really a dramatic increase in cases, uh, except of course when the start coincided with peaks such as in the UK and uh, in uh, Israel. So in other countries, as I was saying, within one or two months, you got really very steep, huge increases in, uh, in cases of uh, infectivity. You got also a dramatic, since we vaccinated, started mass vaccination, a dramatic and fast increase in the number and the level of infectiousness of the more infectious variants. Uh, again, this is completely unprecedented. I gave you the example of the uh, flu, flu uh, influenza 1918, where uh, no variants were even seen uh, during the whole uh, pandemic. So um, on top, what we also see since mass vaccination is that we have enhanced convergence of selected mutations, really more specifically to the receptor binding domain of the S protein. And then we also see um, an increase in, I call this super spreading events where for example, virus comes in, people are vaccinated. They may not uh, have gotten severe disease. They become uh, mildly ill, et cetera. But uh, within just a few days or just a few, uh, uh, yeah, a few days, you, you spread the virus throughout all of the community. That is what has been seen, for example, in, uh, in elderly homes and, um, and, and, and nursing homes. And uh, now you also start to see uh, an increase in the number of uh, partial or even full resistance cases that, have, uh, that are reported. So there is an increasing number of cases that uh, have been reported now in the media and that uh, relate, in fact, to people who have been infect uh, in injected twice, have been the, the full vaccination regimen, and that um, got uh, severe disease. So uh, all of this, for me, clearly points to the fact that mass vaccination combined with these stringent infection prevention measures is really, really, really driving uh, higher rates of infectivity, higher rates uh, of uh, disease, uh, all due to immune escape, uh, which gives rise to more infectious variants and ultimately um, resistance. And uh, you, you can ask yourself, well, what has this to do with the goal of the mass vaccination campaign as well? Because how does this relate to the growing herd immunity and that we were expected from mass vaccination and control of highly infectious variants? None of this is uh, seen, and, and I think this is a really, really uh, a dramatic contrast to what we are really seeing, which are the things that I have highlighted uh, under these bullets. So, um, well, how to remedy? What, what, what can we do about this? Um, well, in, in case of a natural pandemic, I think it's, it's, it's very easy, but we're no longer dealing with a natural pandemic. You have these highly vulnerable people here. Well, the, the infection comes in, these people are vulnerable. We need to take care of these people. We need to treat them in a very early stage. And since they are often in like long-term uh, care facilities or nursing homes and elderly homes, uh, the infection will spread very, very rapidly. So uh, it has no sense to, to, it doesn't make sense to vaccinate. What I think do make sense is to extend the early treatment, not only on people who have the disease, but at all the people in that community to immediately, uh, effectively and dramatically diminish the, um, the infectivity rate. Uh, as far as the uh, asymptomatically uh, infected or, or uh, the healthy people, I would say, um, who are protected, uh, concerned, to, to the extent that they are, well, they, of course, will, the, the, the virus will uh, circulate in, uh, in, in this community, but uh, as long as they have a good natural immunity, 
And as long as they avoid things like crowding, especially you know in rooms with bad ventilation, etc., outdoors, I think it's acceptable. But if they are in have good uh, innate immunity, so good health and uh, good lifestyle, and we have already been talking about this, and on top. Uh, they avow, uh, avoid crowding, they will be able to control this virus. Uh, because remember, the major source is, the, is this one. And we, of course, need to avoid spread from this reservoir as much as we can. We cannot always, because some people need to work there. Uh, and uh, nurses, that, uh, pay, people who take, uh, take care of the elderly, for example, but still, when the virus will come in, and we will not be able to avoid this because uh, SARS-CoV-2, for example, or we would not have been able, uh, is shed by uh, people who are asymptomatically infected, but provided you boost this innate immunity or you have this innate immunity at a high level, you avoid things like supercrowding, et cetera, the uh, population should be able to deal with this. And of course, from time to time, you will have a case. Remember, as I said, some people, may uh, be infected or reinfected just you know a short while after they got uh, asymptomatically infected they get a new infection while sitting on suboptimal antibodies but that is something which you typically have when you have a good herd immunity as you have here and uh, you have an, an outbreak okay so in the case of the current pandemic i think we have no choice uh, we, we have nothing left here. We need, we need absolutely, I don't think there is anything else we can do um, to vaccinate asymptomatic carriers. And if, if we would, let's say, we had already the highly infectious variants before the mass vaccination started. Those highly infectious variants, as I tried to explain, were primarily circulating in, um, in asymptomatic carriers. So we, at that moment, you, it might have uh, been sufficient to just uh, immunize, vaccinate those people, but uh, definitely with vaccines that provide uh, sterilizing immunity. And those who get ill, same as in the vulnerable, to treat them at an early stage for their own benefit and for the benefit, of course, for uh, the community to, to, to diminish the uh, infectivity rate. Now that, uh, or once you, you have a lot of people vaccinated, and uh, certainly when you have uh, people who will ultimately um, become resistant to the vaccines, then you have no choice, but you have to vaccinate everyone. I think although the cases of resistance are not uh, clear cut yet, but I, I am sure, unfortunately, I mean, I have tears in my eyes when I say this, but I, I'm sure it will happen in Israel and in the UK, but as long, even already now, because so many people are vaccinated there, we should intervene with vaccines that eradicate the infectious variants. And, and, uh, and of course, if resistance will come, and if those peaks will appear, then everybody will say, well, yeah, it was not a very good thing to, to do the mass vaccination. And, uh, and revaccinate them will not make sense because we'll simply recall your old antibodies, uh, which have memory, and, and those, those antibodies don't fit at all with, with the new variants that come or with the, the resistance rates. So, um, so, so, so that will not help. But then uh, everybody will, of course, acknowledge, yeah, we, we, must, we must eradicate these strains. And then this would need to apply, of course, to uh, all people, not only uh, the asymptomatic carriers, but all the vaccinees. So what is the summary of this? Well, I hope I have shown you that um, uh, the importance, uh, I forgot some words there, uh, how innate immunity, must, uh, you, it should read, how innate immunity, of course, is a cornerstone of herd immunity, how innate immunity is weakened by increased infectivity rates, and that is, of course, due, for example, in the current pandemic to the enhanced circulation of more infectious variants that was already going on before we implemented the mass vaccination campaigns, how the erosion of the innate immunity is compensated by adaptive immunity during a natural pandemic, so that's great. How the protective equilibrium establishes at the end of a natural uh, pandemic. So you get this kind of, you know, an, a natural equilibrium between the two uh, arms of the immune uh, population immunity and it's protective. 
how mass vaccination, however, in the heat of a pandemic, first puts innate and then adaptive immunity out of business. The current experiment, I mean, none of these things, and especially not the critical importance of innate immunity has been taken into account when this experiment was started, is this is exactly how one would proceed to generate highly infectious variants that ultimately resist the vaccines. What would you do? Well, you would start off already with variants that are more infectious. That's what I think we have been doing by uh, global implementation of the stringent uh, infection prevention measures. And then these infectious variants, you can very, very easily breed them to uh, make them more dominant in the population. Because as soon as you start vaccinating with uh, antibodies against uh, the S protein of the original strain, you give them a competitive advantage. And by doing this mass vaccination, putting everybody, no, not everybody, but many, many people under suboptimal um, conditions with the virus being permanently around and during the pandemic, you, you, you generate a kind of breeding ground for these variants to become more and more uh, infectious and ultimately resist to these high affinity uh, antibodies uh, directed to, towards the receptor binding domain uh, and, and induced in the vaccine. So um, at this stage, I think emphasis P is missing there, P, a P is missing there. Emphasis should be placed on early treatment in-house serological self-testing. I think the most safe thing um, right now is to make sure you are uh, seronegative. You have no antibodies uh, uh, S, uh, against S because uh, the antibodies uh, you may have, uh, it's, it's, it's increasingly unlikely that they will still work against the highly infectious variants that we are facing. And, uh, and they suppress your innate immunity. So the best thing for me is to make sure and to have a kind of uh, in-house uh, testing system, a kit, um, a finger prick test or something like this, where you would assure that you're negative. Because if you're negative, you know your innate immune response, your innate antibodies are not suppressed and they can deal literally with all kinds, all kinds of different COVID variants, even including uh, coronaviruses. And, uh, and then of course, we need to really seriously to think about immune interventions that enable eradication of this virus. Thank you so much for your attention.